In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but it was clearly understood in my family that getting a good education was important and basically a non-negotiable expectation that my parents had for me and my three siblings as we were growing up. As an adolescent and young adult, I have to say that I didn't enjoy academics very much, much less the rigors of being a good student. Thank, God, thank goodness that they stuck to their position of what they believed was best for me. And I know that God does have a sense of humor because once I found something that I really wanted to study, my family thought that I had really gone overboard completing two masters and a doctoral degree. St. Benedict said that we are to learn until the day that we die. Now, of course, St. Benedict was talking about scripture and the wisdom of the Desert Fathers, not educational degrees such as we have today that too often have little or nothing to do with God or his creation. You don't need to take it from me. Ask any number of people in this parish who have been involved in Bible study for a long time. The more you learn, the more you understand how much you don't know. To truly be a follower of Jesus Christ and put him first in your life, you need to know everything that you can. While salvation does not come from head knowledge, head knowledge becomes heart knowledge over time. When we understand, of course, to what level we're able to understand God's plan of salvation for his people and how it has worked together over the centuries in spite of and maybe even as a result of some of the challenges and suffering that goes along with growing in the faith, our resiliency, confidence in our Lord, and faith blossom. Those who were opposed to Jesus and his teachings either ignored him or were constantly trying to entangle him in a web of controversy to stop people from following him and to try and to silence his voice and his witness. We just heard an example of a religious leader trying to trip Jesus up in today's gospel reading when the lawyer asks Jesus, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Torah, the first five books of the Hebrew scriptures, or those attributed to Moses, contains 613 mitzvot, or commandments. Consistent with those teachings and the word of God, Jesus provided not only an answer, but a profound revelation that, it can, that encapsulates the essence of our faith and the purpose of our lives. First, Jesus affirmed the commandment to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. This is not simply a suggestion, but a fundamental directive that should guide every aspect of our lives. This is set the second part of the opening verse of the Shema, which is the hallmark prayer of Judaism. Jews pray the Shema twice daily. Our devotion to God should not be a mere ritualistic exercise, but a heartfelt, fervent, and wholehearted commitment that shapes our thoughts, our actions, and our aspirations. We are called to surrender our entire being to the divine will, to seek his guidance in all things, and to honor his presence in every moment of our existence. As we say in the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done. But Jesus didn't stop there. He emphasized the interconnected nature of the greatest commandment by adding that the second commandment is equally important, to love our neighbors as ourselves. This, too, is a mitzvot of Torah found in Leviticus 19.18. This directive makes clear the imperative that God expects of us to extend our love, compassion, 
and understanding to all those around us, irrespective of their backgrounds, beliefs, or circumstances. Our love for others should mirror the unconditional love that God gives us. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are to be vessels of his love, spreading kindness and generosity wherever we go. Understanding these contexts can help us grasp the profound depth and significance of these commandments. They serve as guiding principles for our moral and spiritual conduct, shaping our relationship with God and with one another. As we contemplate these teachings, may we strive to internalize their essence and integrate them into the fabric of our lives, fostering a deeper connection with God and a more compassionate and inclusive approach to our relationships with those around us. As we say pretty boldly on the wall outside the library from Romans 15, 7, welcome one another therefore as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. It's easy to say that we love our neighbors in the abstract. It's much harder to put it into practice. In fact, Jesus' command to love our enemies is often easier than loving our neighbors. We tend to push enemies away and keep them out of our lives. It's easy to love in the, in the abstract at arm's length. It's much harder to love up close where things get messy. You know, loving our neighbor whose dog barks incessantly and who won't do anything about it. Or the neighbor who walks that same dog across your yard and doesn't pick up after it or family members, or even members of our congregation who don't see the things the way we see them, or maybe they just bug us in some way, or community leaders who don't appear to listen to our concerns. Well, it's hard, isn't it? In each case, what makes it hard is the pride of our own petty egos that seek self rather than the good of the other. Letting go of the ego is the way of the cross. After Jesus answers the lawyer's questions, he then presents his own questions to the Pharisees. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. Then he said to them, how is it then that David, by the Spirit, calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? The Psalms in Jesus' day were attributed to King David. Notice that Jesus says that David was informed by the Spirit. The psalm to which Jesus is referring is Psalm 110, verse 1, which reads, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. King David indicates in this verse that the Messiah is definitely his superior, not his subordinate, and therefore not simply his son. The Messiah is not only of the lineage of King David, but also transcends David's line. Jesus' messianic identity surpasses all the expectations of the Messiah, even as he fulfills the law and the prophets. Clearly, Jesus is well acquainted with Scripture and assumes the same of those with whom he spars. Even though Jesus is a faithful Jew, he breaks the norms of Judaism when he expanded God's concern for those beyond faithful Judaism. God's plan and purpose is for all people, not merely those whom he identified as his chosen people. Those who, God, who love God 
must love all that God created, even when it diminishes our own status and privilege. Jesus refused to identify love of God with rigid religious requirements or to identify faithfulness to himself with loyalty to a particular community of people. Jesus' followers must subordinate all personal preferences, interests, identities, and purpose to the will of God that was given through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Jesus' mission must be our mission, and we must submit our will to his. The reference to making the Messiah's enemies a footstool on which he will put his feet is an expression of total domination. The Messiah has totally subjugated his opponents. He has, he has tamed them, if you will, and they are no longer a threat to his kingdom. So back to the question at hand. How could the, how could the Messiah be both David's Lord and his son? Of course, the answer is that the Messiah had to be both God and man. He had to be born of David as a human, but also be God who came to earth as Jesus did. This inquiry serves as a profound reminder of the mystery and the majesty of Christ's identity as both being fully divine as well as fully human. It invites us to ponder the depth of our understanding and relationship with Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who came to redeem us from sin and reconcile us to the Father. It encourages us to explore the profound nature of faith, embracing the paradoxes and mysteries that support our spiritual journey. The Pharisees were blinded, although they must have been very familiar with the text from the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel prophesying about the Messiah, they were blinded by their assumptions and their expectations. We must not be blinded like the Pharisees. We must do as St. Benedict instructs and learn until the day we die. I can attest personally that the more I study and learn, the more profound my understanding of God's plan becomes and the more I am in awe of the incredible depths of it. I must remind you that God does not have grandchildren. He has children. We must have our own faith and it must be founded on God's redeeming word. How can we have the foundation if we don't know God's word? Jesus and the author of the Gospel of Matthew were nourished by the rich root of Jewish thought and theology and their convictions about the commandments, messianic expectation, and the necessity of neighborly love found affirmation from others, not only in their own time, but for centuries beyond. In the coming week, I invite you to join me reflecting on these teachings and ask yourself, how am I succeeding in living out the greatest commandment? Am I loving God with all my heart, my soul, and my mind? And then out of God's love, how am I loving or maybe not loving my neighbor as myself? What is God calling me to do so that I can grow deeper in my relationship with Jesus and be faithful in living out my God-given purpose in this life? Pray for the grace to embody these teachings in your daily life so as to better manifest the love of God and to recognize the divine presence in your neighbor, whoever that may be. May God's gospel message deepen our faith, help strengthen our relationships, and help us live as beacons of God's love, mercy, and grace in this world. Amen.